Our next speaker, Dave Nichols, we've already heard, heard a little bit about him um, just then. But, so Dave is an underground researcher and, um, and harm reduction advocate. And he also serves as the editor for Symposium Media. Um, he's the co-host of the Plus Three podcast. And he's also um, an intimate, intermittent moderator of um, DMT Nexus. David has presented a lot on, um, of his social critiques and commentary on psychedelic culture um, and radical politics, as well as novel uh, phytochemical data um, all around the world. And he's a vocal um, opponent of um, psychedelic uh, commodification. And um, in his spare time, he blows glass to kind of avoid monetizing his psychedelic work. So today, David will be talking about um, whose stories are we telling, um, ethnobotanical understanding, understandings in the corporate uh, corporatelic era, um, and this is um, around storytelling and how it plays a central role um, in the transmission of knowledge and throughout time. And because stories aren't static, and as psychedelics go mainstream, the people controlling that narrative um, can control the, the perspectives. Um, and there's a bit of a competition around the the dominance of that narrative and the marketplace of ideas. And it's up to members of the psychedelic community to really develop and maintain um, and disseminate evidence-based uh, ethnobotanical frameworks that enable us to distinguish the ship from the Shinola. Um, yeah, so that's enough from me and um, we'll get David on. Thanks, Lee. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate that. Uh, and just want to take a moment and draw attention to, to Nick's comments that we love to hear when things are going wrong so that we can fix them. Because I would say, you know, looking at that and looking at the, the comment about stone throwing, well, well, I suspect some of the stones are fuzzy, maybe some of them less so. But I think uh, if, if more folks within and around psychedelic spaces had that attitude that we want to know when things go wrong so we can fix them. Uh, perhaps there would be less need for, for some stones. But um, with that out of the way, today's talk is, is whose stories are we telling ethnobotanical understandings in the corporatelic era? And I want to take a moment and sort of situate why this talk in particular. So uh, this talk came about as a result of a sort of ongoing back and forth that I have with Ronnie, one of the wonderful uh, EBA coordinators, organizers, where uh, Ronnie tries to get me to focus as much as possible on the plants. And I try to figure out how to get different sort of political ideas and analysis into the talks. And we go back and forth and, and usually we wind up at some sort of... Um, I'd like to believe interesting sort of fusion. Now, this talk was proposed over two years ago, sort of before COVID-19 shut quite a bit down for quite a while. And uh, in those intervening two years, quite a bit happened. So I helped create and produce the cover story podcast with Symposia and New York Magazine. Um, and uh, Symposia has done quite a bit of work in the intervening period as well. And the narratives about psychedelic drugs are changing. I would contend that they're changing largely due to profit motives and corporate interests. And as more mainstream attention is coming towards psychedelics, um, I would contend that those profit motives and interests are increasing and expanding, even as some of the psychedelic pharma market has been undergoing a bit of a prolonged crash. But in addition to these sorts of narrative pressures, there's also been a number of abusive individuals and organizations who have been identified over the last few years. And the narratives that some of these exposés point to, I think, are really significant, not only to where we're at at the present moment, but also in sort of understanding how we got here. And so to take this back a little over two years ago, the idea that sort of set this talk in motion was in, in going back and forth with Ronnie, I, I wanted to explore how cultural understandings around uh, mushrooms have sort of changed in between Gordon Wasson's expedition and expropriation of Mazatec knowledge to the present activities of Compass Pathways, who, uh, if you haven't heard of them, they're one of the largest, uh, best-funded sort of corporate outfits that are looking to 
turn psilocybin into some sort of medicine. And one of the things that I was struck in sort of looking at a broad strokes overview of this history is that we're talking about the same drug, right? We're talking about psilocybin. The drug hasn't changed. In fact, what's changed is the cultural container, the set, the setting, the context. And that's not surprising. In that that's always in flux. But I think if we look at the last decade and particularly the last five years or so, we can see that there's been quite a bit of acceleration in the need of, of some of those changes to set and setting. And I want to give a, a brief disclaimer that this talk is going to focus on problematizing narratives around some of the more colonial or exploitative, extractive characters, rather than, than telling or exploring some of the uh, indigenous stories that just dealing with own expertise and uh, awareness and just wanting to stick to the things that I have more familiarity with. I also want to give a very brief content warning that there will be some mention of um, sexual transgressions, assault, things tied to therapist abuse. And I just wanted to, to flag that ahead of time so that folks can be prepared. Um, and most of that will come up on slides that are tied to uh, Francoise Borsat, but there may be a little bit of, of that around some MMA slides as well. But with that being said, um, the first sort of historical narrative questions that I want to look at are that of uh, Gordon Wasson and Maria Sabina. So Wasson was uh, vice president for PR at J.B. Morgan & Co. Uh, if you've heard uh, him referred to as a banker, uh, this is why. He and his wife, Valentina, were ethnomycologists. Uh, they published quite a few books and, and had different sort of adventures into um, mushroom hunting in a, in a variety of contexts. And uh, it turns out as well that Wasson was an unwitting participant in MKUltra Subproject 58. Uh, he wasn't alone as far as being an unwitting participant. Basically, what I mean here is he received funding. Um, Leary was also in the same boat for some things and, and quite a few other people. This is more sort of an interesting historical tidbit rather than uh, my uh, as an attempt to like paint a broad, grand uh, conspiracy here. So um, Wasson goes down to uh, study mushrooms um, and, and heads to the Mazatec. He meets Maria Sabina, who is a Mazatec uh, curandera. Um, she introduces Wasson to the mushroom and the ceremony around that, the velada. Um, and as a result of sharing this knowledge and uh, interacting with other Westerners, uh, industrial folks from industrial contexts, uh, Sabina winds up ostracized from her community and ultimately dies in poverty, suffering from malnutrition. It's a really grim story of, um, you know, people have referred to it as biopiracy, cultural exploitation, expropriation. Um, and, and I think, you know, as much as there are nods to this in much of the public discourse, I think it also frequently gets glossed over. So Wasson comes back from his expedition and uh, writing experience in Life magazine. Um, his experience is, uh, focuses a lot on sort of uh, divine experiences, experiences of God, out-of-body experience, uh, the sort of presence of the ineffable and some sort of ultimate being, ultimate truth, uh, out-of-body experiences, things that I would assume are quite familiar to uh, many of us who have done mushrooms and other psychedelics. Um, I do want to highlight that as, as familiar as some of this might sound, it's actually a bit of a different framework than uh, Maria Sabina would, would or presented. So uh, here's a quote from her where she says, it's true that Wasson and his friends were the first foreigners who came to our town in search of the St. Children, what she referred to as the mushrooms. Um, and that they didn't take them because they suffered from any illness. Their reason was that they came to find God. She also says, before Wasson, nobody took the mushrooms only to find God. They were always taken for the sick to get well. Now, uh, in addition to these quotes, I found uh, a quote I quite appreciated from Steve Bayer, sort of commenting on Espina's framework. And he points out, somewhat wryly, that to find God, Sabina, who considered herself a Catholic, went to Mass. 
So when I look at sort of Wasson's experience and, and Maria Savina's commentary, to my mind, it raised these questions about storytelling and knowledge and who who is seen as authoritative when it comes to storytelling or to narrative. And it actually, uh, a framework that I thought was quite relevant for this are sort of three questions that Shoshana Zuboff poses in her great book, uh, Dealing with Surveillance Capitalism. Um, and the, the three questions are who knows, who decides, and who decides, who decides. So when we're asking the question of who knows, it's, and I've sort of tweaked these a little bit from their initial context uh, in order to sort of apply them to these narrative questions. And so in this context, I'm, I'm interested in asking about whether somebody's knowledge is seen as legitimate or not, and sort of what is it that, um, that goes into that knowledge. So in the case of Wasson and Sabina, um, we have this question of experiential and cultural knowledge, where uh, Wasson obviously has the direct experience of the mushroom. Maria Sabina also has that. She also has a cultural container in which certain narratives have been crafted and presented and handed down over time. Um, we also, so the, the following question of, of who decides, it's the question of, you know, which people, institutions, or processes determine whose knowledge is legitimate. And more, more broadly, sort of how that knowledge is disseminated into the world, what can be done with it, right? And, and who ends up being the arbiter of that sort of uh, spread, transmission, or action. And then the third question is who decides who decides? And that's basically um, how does somebody get the power to be in that position of decision maker, right? How does somebody have the authority to ultimately decide who knows? And I think, you know, in the abstract, these can sound like rather um, uh, vague constructs in some ways. But I think when we apply them on the ground and, and if we look at some of the power dynamics, we can see how a little bit of this plays out. So if we look at the uh, Wasson Sabina power dynamics, there are these really, um, my, my colleague at Symposia, Dr. Nishay Devino, shared some passages with me from Wasson's writing dealing with his conceptualizations around consent, where he basically forces um, flash photography on Maria Sabina and takes pictures of her while she's uh, doing ceremony on mushrooms. And yet the way that he writes about it, he talks about her giving consent, but the way the sentences are constructed around how he coerced or leveraged or pried that consent out of her, it doesn't really sound very consensual. And when she she acquiesces to him taking these photographs, there's also a discussion that photographs would just be used for sort of, uh, that, that they wouldn't be widely shared, right? That they would be kept more private. And given that these photographs then spill out into um, popular uh, media, right? We can see that there's a total disregard for one of the conditions that was put onto allowing photography in this very intimate, sacred healing space. And so um, Wasson ends up using the media to advance his narrative. Uh, and, and he uses sort of the ill-gotten gains that he has coerced from Sabina to then advance sort of his tale of the magical, phenomenal mushroom. And so if we start looking at this matrix, we can see, and, and if we look at things historically, we can see that the way knowledge is situated, that it's Wasson who is seen as knowing and that the way that, that it is decided that he knows is that he's able to disseminate his knowledge through the media, you know, using these other sort of neocranial conceptualizations, framing. Um, he sort of appeals to these broader uh, structural, you know, social structures in order to cement a type of legitimacy in what he's uh, disseminating. And we can see that in, in sort of the, the adventurers of, of you know, yesteryear, looking through old National Geographic or what have you. Um, but the way this plays out, right, as a result of these dynamics, Wasson's story becomes a, a seriously undergirding story within industrial contexts that are looking at psychedelics. I mean, this is one of the sort of origin stories of psychedelia within uh, uh, industrial contexts. And the thing is, Wasson isn't the only example of this. I, I just think his the way that he's situated and the way that both he and Maria Sabina 
are sort of looked to as some of the um, earliest players on, on this particular terrain, it's worth highlighting. I think it's also worth highlighting because of how some of his understandings and claims and experiences have sort of cascaded over time and have created a bit of a foundation that other people rest on. So, like I said, he's not the only example of this. Uh, he's more historical, but we can see similar things happening in recent times. So um, one of the people that we cover in the Cover Story Power Trip podcast is a woman named Francoise Borzat. Um, she and her husband uh, ran this run, I, maybe to some defunct degree, this uh, consciousness medicine community. Um, they have engaged in abuse over a period of decades. And she identifies as a Mazatec lineage holder who draws a direct line or sort of an indirect line to Maria Sabina, but she makes all sorts of claims. So if you look on that top line, um, Maria Sabina is the, the figure farthest in, uh, up, upper left. Uh, and then to her right is Salvador Roquette and to his right is Pablo Sanchez. Now, Salvador Roquette was a Mexican psychiatrist who tortured uh, student dissidents for the Mexican state, giving them high doses of psychedelics, a whole variety of different drugs, um, played loud music, really disturbing imagery, stroboscopic lights, sort of the MK Ultra style torture and um, sensory overloads. We cover a good bit of that on the podcast. I'd invite anyone who hasn't heard to uh, give a listen. And then to his right is Pablo Sanchez, who is not Mazatec, um, but was uh, uh, Indigenous American. And um, yeah, so so Francoise has given a variety of talks and writings where she sort of ties herself to Maria Sabina. And um, I thought that was really interesting because if we compare that and, and Francoise's claims of being part of this lineage to Maria Sabina's take on lineage, uh, Maria Sabina says... Bishop advised me to initiate my children into the wisdom I have. I told him that the color of the skin or the eyes can be inherited, including the manner of crying or of smiling, but the same can't be done with wisdom. Wisdom can't be inherited. Wisdom is brought with one from birth. My wisdom can't be taught. That's why I say that nobody taught me my language, because it is the language the saint children speak upon entering my body isn't born to be wise can't attain the language although they do many vigils who could teach a language like that my daughter apollonia just helps me to pray or to repeat my language during the vigils she speaks and says what i ask her to but she isn't a wise woman she wasn't born with that destiny apollonia and viviana my two daughters will never be wise women they will not receive the book from the hands of the principal ones and so the way that that Bordat sort of claims to be part of this lineage, you know, when when Sabina is explicit in her oral autobiography that that, you know, this this doesn't really work like that. Um, it's rather odd. And again, I, I th this will come up in a, a little bit later as well. But this isn't to say that, you know, Maria Sabina is the authority on what is or isn't the case when it comes to psilocybin experiences. But for people who are claiming the authority of her lineage or her knowing or her worldview, I think pointing to some of these inconsistencies is important. And this comes up again where um, Borzat ascribed Watson's God seeking to the Mazatec. Uh, we interviewed Francoise for the podcast. And she told us, you know, well, the Mazatec use mushrooms for an overall access to the spiritual world, to clearing and cleaning their heart and to circulate energy in the body, clarify relationships and to pray, to have a devotional practice, to have access to their relational pathway with the divine God, as they call it. Now, we can contrast that with Maria Sabina's own words, saying, before Wasson, nobody took the mushrooms only to find God. They were always taken for the sick to get well. Again, this isn't about that being the truth of psilocybin, just pointing out the internal consistency, the inconsistencies with uh, the, these claims of um, Mazatec lineage and, and being in the vein of Sabina. Now, 
this proximity to indigeneity being sort of held out or offered up as a narrative that grants legitimacy is really concerning to me because Borzat and her husband Grossbard actually abused numerous people um, over over a course of decades. I mean, there were court records that uh, uh, Lily, um, my partner in the podcast and, and this work and colleague at Symposia, uh, and I, you know, uncovered as we were um first doing some of the preliminary research into the podcast, and we were horrified to see how far back some of this stuff went. And yet claims about their proximity to indigenous people were central beyond these like claims of legitimacy to normalizing abuse. And one example of this sort of claim of authority and legitimacy, uh, there, there was a talk that Francoise gave um, sort of in dialogue with uh, Izzy Ali, who is with MAPS, uh, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. This was put on by an organization called Psychedelic Seminars, and it was called Indigenous, uh, Weaving Worlds, Indigenous Traditions, and Western Psychotherapy. Now, Francoise isn't a psychotherapist, and I know that things are a little different in Australia, and I don't think you need any sort of license or anything to call yourself a psychotherapist. In the U.S., it's different, particularly in California, where Francoise lives. It's uh, not legal to refer to yourself as a psychotherapist if you are not a certified uh, psychotherapist. So in this talk, or following the talk, there, there was a Q&A that was done in which Francoise sort of offers up all of these claims about the importance of sexual healing and psychedelics, you know, going so far as to advocate for um, some sort of sexual healing for people under the influence of psychedelics, saying at one point, um, sexual healers get a bad rap, and I think we actually need to go ahead and put them up on a pedestal. I mean, things that in, in light of her abuse were really disturbing. I, I would suggest they were disturbing without that. Um, but then looking at what was going on at the same time that she was giving this talk or, or had gone on shortly before, um, quite disturbing. And yet the way that she sort of weaves her takes on the appropriateness of sexual contact and, and engaging in sort of what I would consider to be rather risky behavior as far as uh, mixing, you know, some sort of sex work plus psychedelics and questions about blurred lines of consent. All of that is both uh, normalized and sort of woven into stories about what is or is not appropriate in indigenous contexts, how this would measure up. And yet here's this moment where this, this French woman is making claims about indigenous authority and indigenous ways and sort of acting as a spokesperson or representative of uh, communities that that I don't actually know, you know, to what degree she has authority to speak for. And then when we look at some of the contradictions that already come up with the people that she's claiming as her lineage, um, to me, it just, it raises real big questions, particularly when it's used to sort of camouflage some of this behavior. Now, um, this is perhaps a more insidious example of warring narratives or narrative tensions or plot holes or whatever you want to call it. If we look at medicalization sort of as a whole, we can see that it brings with it sort of a host of stories ranging from meta narratives, you know, sort of overarching themes like medicalization is uh, some sort of Trojan horse to achieve legalization. Um, and, you know, that, that, sort of narrative comes with its own problems, where now, instead of just pointing to the problems of prohibition, you have to show that drugs are safe and effective for particular interventions and particular uh, indications. And um, you sort of change uh, the, the burden of evidence required there. But then you have all of these different subplots, right? People such as university researchers who are trying to tell stories about, you know, psilocybin for major depressive disorder or treatment resistant depression or end of life anxiety. And as I was going through some of these uh, studies and, and subplots or whatever we want to call them, I was reminded that one of the first things I did to sort of offer some sort of legitimacy and to offer a palatable narrative to my parents in the wake of my first trip 
um, was to share them this uh, John Hopkins study that was published in 2006, Psilocybin Can Occasion Mystical Type Experiences, right? And as I was putting this talk together, I had to kind of chuckle because I realized, ah, here again is, is Wasson and the divine experience at the heart of the mushroom. And just thinking back to how much easier it made to be able to offer my parents this sort of... Uh, pre-made ready crafted narrative of no no I'm not I'm not just getting high I'm I'm having mystical type experiences um I don't know I I found it amusing and and seeing it again in dialogue with with Wasson's writing uh, I was struck by how how tenacious or or how ingrained some of those ideas are now, if we look at some of the narratives taking place within the context of medicalization, I would contend that we see a whole lot of, of tensions around Zuboff's questions of who knows, who decides, and who decides, who decides. And there's this really interesting one that emerges when we look at some of the corporate executives who have admitted on the record that they've had uh, psychedelic experiences. And... Uh, we could look at, say, the the C-suite over at Compass Pathways, where you got uh, Christian Angermeyer and Lars Wilde and um, Florian Brand, or some of them may have shifted around to sister companies. But, um, you know, they're all on the record as having done psychedelics. And, you know, Angermeyer says, oh, he, they're, they're all very quick to say that they did them in places where it was legal. So Angermeyer, uh, and he hasn't been able to keep his story straight, right? In, in one case, Angermeyer says his experience was on a yacht in the Caribbean. On another one, he says um, it was somewhere in the Netherlands, like out in the woods. Um, you have them talking about how medicalization is the only really safe way to do these drugs. And yet all of them are talking about doing these either in non-medical contexts or these weird, sketchy, sort of pseudo-medical-ish uh, setups. And so there's this, this double standard that comes and that functions again in the fact that, um, sorry, it highlights Zuboff's questions of uh, epistemic authority and, and who gets to decide and where they derive their power from when you have executives and millionaires and billionaires who are ultimately saying we get to do drugs in whatever sort of context we want. And then we have access to the broader con uh, systems of social control that allow us to impose our will and say everybody else needs to do these in a medical context. I think it raises real interesting questions about narrative. Now, sticking with the theme of narrative, I think that that the FDA or the TGA in Australia and the different regulatory bodies sort of all wire different stories. And I want to highlight that who gets to tell these stories matters. In fact, I would say this is sort of a core component of the work that Symposia does. Uh, it was definitely a core component of the work that Lily and I tried to engage in uh, with cover story power and trying to center and amplify voices that have either been sidelined or marginalized or or neglected. And um, I guess some examples that I can give is that if you look at situations of researchers and participants or therapists and clients, there are very clear power dynamics and there are real sort of uh, issues of authority when you have, you know, I mean, there's discourse around the white coat and the the signifier of authorities that come with being in that sort of medical professional um, context or, or, or role and the way that that sort of emanates authority you have right like the different trappings of that but then if you look for example at some of the participants that we spoke to who had participated in clinical research for uh, psychedelics uh, or MDMA for PTSD um, we can see that the way that they were or weren't listened to actually factors in quite a bit to the regulatory decisions that get made. So when a participant says, hey, I'm having mood drops, I'm feeling increased suicidality, I'm feeling like, you know, we're leaving a whole lot of stuff unresolved and, you know, the trial is going to be wrapping soon and I'm going to be on my own and you're leaving me with this. And the therapists come back and say, oh, no, 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 we, we know that things get worse before they get better. There is a moment where the participants experience is getting steamrolled. And in addition to the sort of tension in that moment, if the researcher believes that they are the authority, that they know that in fact, 
yeah, maybe the participants expressing some distress, but they're not really distressed because this is part of the healing process. It raises real questions about which stories get recorded on the scientific record. And when only one of those groups, you know, whether it's uh, researchers having access to um, the materials they choose to then write up into peer reviewed studies or it's therapists ultimately, you know, writing out client notes or what have you. Right. The tension around epistemic authority loom large. And I think, you know, perhaps one of the most clear cut cases is the case of Megan Buisson, who was a, a MAPS phase two trial participant who was assaulted by her, her study therapist on camera. And yet, despite her various uh, uh, claims about what had gone down, you know, um, MAPS, the sponsor organization, acted as though there was some sort of, that, that they were unable to foresee what happened. They actually put out a statement that said, um, you know, neither having two therapists on hand nor videotaped evidence uh, was, or sorry, videotaped sessions were enough to prevent the, the uh, they didn't refer to it as abuse, but I'll just say the abuse that happened, right? And that narrative stood strong for, for a couple of years that came out in 2019. Now, having had access to those tapes and, and as part of Cover Story Power Trip, we published some excerpts of those sessions with Megan's uh, consent and permission. Um, it was quite clear how wrong things were going on videotape. And, and at that moment, that sort of upends that narrative. But most people don't have the luxury of having access to video recorded evidence of their experience, whether with their therapist or underground practitioner or clinical trial, uh, uh, you know, the question, I mean, MAPS has been denying people access to their videos when they've reached out in the wake of, of cover story to find out uh, if they can, can view their own footage, they're being told no. Right. And so this question of how to resolve these narrative tensions, particularly as some of these different holes in the narrative are appearing, is one that, like, I think if we don't tackle sooner rather than later, we're going to find that there is uh, an increasing number of problems and problems that are kind of unavoidable. But uh, I, I can hear Ronnie's voice right now basically demanding to know what happened to the plants. And, and I'm sorry, Ronnie, I know things have changed a little bit since the first talk was uh, presented, but but for me, you know, this sort of highlights this question of whether or not there's actually room for the plants amidst what's going on in the mainstream. And I have to say, I was super heartened to hear, um, you know, to catch the uh, the banner before my talk and to 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 hear plant heads talking about plants. I would say it was like a, a I, I felt my heart sore because personally, I haven't had time. To, to deal with the plants. When I have people who are coming forward to disclose uh, the harms that they've experienced either underground or in clinical trial contexts or dealing with some of the organizations that are marching medicalization forward, unfortunately, that's felt a bit more, if not compelling, um, it's it, it felt like it's more necessary to sort of try to put out some of those fires than to be able to do the fun sort of phytochemical drug nerd stuff, plant head stuff that I used to get to do with some frequency. I think also if, if we look around at the mainstream psychedelic discourse, like yes, there's certainly room for the plants, but I think one effect of the strategies of medicalization is that we now see people spending tremendous amounts of time on really stupid shit, like, like patent wars and um, the creation of novel psychedelic compounds that are really just another salt form of the same old drugs that have been around for decades or slightly tweaked molecules or putting psilocybin on a sublingual, you know, breath mint strip type thing. Um, so I, I just want to take a moment and give three cheers for EGA because, uh, you know, thinking back to the last garden states and the plant market and the conversations that that took place and, and the interactions, like I have to say EGA has consistently been like one of my favorite spaces to actually engage with plants. And maybe I should apologize for, for pulling things out of that arena a little bit. But um, the truth is that the current moment is rife with narrative conflict. And it feels really important to highlight some of that, especially when these questions of knowledge and knowing and decision making around how that knowledge is disseminated, or if that knowledge is disseminated, feel uh, quite central. And so, um, yeah, I guess 
let's take a look at some more examples and, and I'll, I'll cover some stuff that uh, absolutely deals with the plants. So in I've mentioned Christian Angermeyer already. Uh, he's a billionaire investor behind Compass Pathways. He's got a bunch of other stuff as well. He's big into crypto. Um, he's a psychedelic newcomer, quite, quite the hype man. And he's a business partner of Peter Thiel. He's also an advisor to Paul Kagame, the murderous dictator uh, over in Rwanda. And he recently, or I guess earlier in the year, took to uh, Twitter and other social media to talk about how he had just acquired this statue of Osiris and wasn't it so cool because uh, mythology connects him to a tree that contains DMT and um, you know, DMT is used in ayahuasca and also he's the god of the afterlife and Christian is one of those billionaires who's uh, very focused on figuring out how to live forever, believe that, you know, aging and death are just like unnatural and uh, he's going to fix that problem. But I was super curious about his claims of, of you know, uh, an acacia connection to Osiris and this, that, and the other. It turns out that the plant is acacia nilotica. So uh, SNU, Google Brinder, has covered this in uh, Garden of Eden, uh, phenomenal work. Um, if you don't have a copy, go get a digital copy uh, online. Can't recommend it enough. But Snu is quite clear here that even though there have been the occasional sort of preliminary tests that here and there have shown possible hits for EMT, the the experts who have engaged in this, you know, here's here's the highlight section that says Ott retracted the statement, leave stem bark, uh, roots, and seeds have all tested negative for alkaloids. There was another tentative test that showed trace amounts of 5-MeO um, or, or DMT or NMT, but none of this has ever been confirmed. So hugely speculative, not really tied to any sort of um, um, reality. And of course, uh, when I pointed this out to Angermeyer, he didn't seem particularly interested, certainly didn't correct the record. Um, all of this stuff is still up. He's happy to proclaim that, you know, he is the owner of the Osaichi that connects uh, ancient Egypt to ayahuasca and DMT and what have you. Now, perhaps it's unsurprising that this ethnobotanical misinformation is being brought to you by a man who has described Paul Kagame as the real life Black Panther miracle of Rwanda, um, even as he has had journalists uh, disappeared and has ordered assassinations and um, cleared the streets of, of undesirable populations in order to, to make the Kigale, the capital, look nice. Um, you know, Angermeyer has also promoted chloroquine and, and azithromycin for COVID, suggested that flattening the curve was complete bullshit. Um, a whole bunch of, of positions are very clearly not based in reality. And if you're wondering why I'm ranting about this, you know, why does this matter? Well, I would suggest it matters because he's also making statements that psychedelics are like packing 10,000 hours of psychotherapy into four hours. And while I think many of us have encountered that idea in other psychedelic spaces, um, the notion of somebody like Angermeyer using his resources and his control or, or influence in different psychedelic corporations to start promoting these narratives to an unsuspecting broader public that maybe don't include uh, plant heads and trippers and weirdos who are looking for the trip, but instead looking for um, you know medical interventions, that has quite significant hazards. If you're not looking for uh, an epistemological and ontological disruption and to you know be skyrocketed across the universe, but are in fact looking for something that offers uh, meaningful intervention uh, and hopefully, I guess, uh, interruption of um, significant mental health issues, you know, narratives I think do a disservice. And so considering stories as marketing narratives, I think, is of uh, critical import at the moment. And uh, these excerpts and actually this, this brand character uh, came from some writing I did a few years ago um, discussing a conference that had put, been put on in, in Arizona. Um, one of the people involved in putting it on or sponsoring it was a, a marketer named Ethan Fialco, who ended up publishing this ayahuasca guide site where he published all sorts of misinformation in the interest of promoting ayahuasca. So 
Uh, he claimed that it had, it's been used in the Amazon for 14,000 years. That sort of uh, misses the part where humans didn't really inhabit the Amazon prior to, I think, 11,000 years and some change ago. Um, and the use history of ayahuasca is way, way less than that. Um, but he's also making these dangerous health claims about ayahuasca's ability to permanently heal depression. Um, and then, of course, he, he makes the sales pitch about how, like, many of the successful people you look up to use ayahuasca, you know, the implicit suggestion being that you should too. Um, so this particular example may seem a little silly, but if we look at Christian Angermeyer and see some of the money there, you know, um, there's real potential for harm in considering some of the players who are, are moving into the space. I just want to be clear, like these, the, the problems that come from stories as marketing narratives are not hypothetical. Um, I don't know if there's anyone from MMA in the audience, but here's the address that you can send any uh, legal complaints to. Please leave EGA out of it. Um, there is an organization in Australia called Mind Medicine Australia that has raised a number of questions, I think, when it comes to these issues of narrative tensions and whose stories we're telling. And so I'd like to ask a few questions uh, about them and their approach, right? Like, what happens when narrative tensions spill over into media strategies? So um, MMA put out this video called Shroom Boom with a song that has these lyrics, why can't I get out of bed? It's not because I'm dead, yet the pain never stops, antidepressants and side effects. Um, you know, uh, shroom boom, healing our planet, healing our goal, pharma, karma, pharma, come take the mushroom. And it was actually so concerning that a former uh, researcher from uh, Imperial College commented on their website and, or sorry, on the website, on the YouTube video, and basically urged people listen to the song not to take the advice of the song, not to go off their meds and just start taking mushrooms, that that could be, uh, have disastrous consequences. Um, Eventually, the, the comment was deleted. I'm not sure if that was, I, I believe it may have been due to legal fears. I also want to ask, what happens when these sorts of narratives insulate people who cause harm? Because I interviewed Peter Hunt and Tanya DeYoung uh, of MMA about the fact that they had Francoise Borzat as the number one trainer on their psychedelic certificate program. And I actually read them a number of allegations from a court case that was settled um, ages ago, uh, out of court, they, they paid out. Um, and I read them a list of really disturbing allegations. And, and Peter said to me, rightly or wrongly, we do come from a world that says people are innocent until they're proven guilty. But here I was trying to call attention that one of their trainers uh, for this therapy that was going to be um, introducing rather, you know, uh, training therapists to work with very vulnerable patients, patient populations, um, had all of these rather disturbing allegations. And shouldn't people in this in these positions be held to a higher standard than the notion of, well, if we can't prove that they're guilty in a court of law, well, you know, have to we have to have them as the number one trainer on our certificate program. What happens when when all of these things don't really seem to matter to those with power? So on the right here, you can see a list of the allegations that were brought against Borda and Grossbard. Um, like I said, I, I went through a number of the allegations with Peter and Tanya. We then reached out, Symposia reached out to nearly every individual on their advisory board um, to ask them both about Francoise Borza uh, as the first trainer on their on their CPAT program and about the incorrectly credited accreditation programs. And um, there's a whole host of people who gave us everything from silence to rather abrasive responses to basically telling us where to stick it. And um, I, I just want to highlight that the way that you know, power allows people to accrue narrative authority, even when there are so many completely obvious holes in the narrative, even when there are so many clear examples of acting in bad faith, potentially with malice. Um, like, it, it's just, it's mind boggling, right? Like, these are some of the biggest names in the field who are willing to lend their credibility because there's what? I don't know, a veneer of authority, some sense of legitimacy due to that money and power. 
And so again, I can hear I can hear Ronnie's voice going in the back of my head, and I know we're coming down on time. So I guess the last questions I want to ask, or last question I want to ask is what if the stories that people are telling disconnect us from the plants and fungi and the immediate harms of prohibitionist policies, right? Because as I pointed out earlier, questions of, of medicalization and what it takes to turn drugs into medicine and demonstrate that they're safe and effective are fundamentally different from showing that prohibition is a dangerous, failed, unsafe policy and something that creates way more harm than it could ever address. And so when I think about where we're at in the moment and, and what needs to take place as far as the stories we're telling and, and where we're looking and, and how we want to talk about plants and drugs and the future of psychedelia, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in figuring out and talking with other people about how to give more attention to the counter narratives, how to take time to talk about things that are on more local levels and, and talk to the people who are tending the plants, you know, try to center some of the narratives that have been drowned out in the sort of corporadelic blare. And I guess for me, like, I'd like to figure out to what degrees we can find the other others and amplify stories that show that resistance is fertile. Um, that's really interesting. I really like your, your critical approach to, to these, these topics especially around, you know, controlling the narrative of the medicalization of um, psychedelics, especially when they're targeting um, sometimes vulnerable individuals. Um, and also the double standards of um, that narrative sometimes where you have um, their use to heal sickness, which is often the minority of people that have used psychedelics compared to their youth by healthy individuals to maintain their healthy mind states, and which is often the majority of users. Um, so we have a few questions. Um, how do you think people can get better at being more critical of the, the things they're given by media and online sources? Yeah, um, I mean, I'll say for myself, one of the things that really helped was, and maybe it's sort of a twofold combo, um, but uh, community. So for me, like, and, and virtual community, so I suppose we can put community in, in quotations, but I, you know, I know that, um, so I, I, I spent a number of years on the DMT nexus where I found other plant heads and drug nerds and weirdos and being able to sort of ask questions and have conversations with, um, you know, people of, of different skill sets and experiences and knowledge, either with the plants or, or experiences or chemistry or what have you, and being able to just ask questions. Because a lot of the work that I find myself doing now reminds me of some of the conversations I used to have back in the Nexus chat or on the forums, right, where, where somebody would see a, a sort of charlatan looking practitioner and highlight, oh my God, like, look at the claims they're making about you know, uh, quantum physics and the way that psychedelics allow you to uh, alter this, that, or the other, or, you know, whatever sorts of um, generally more goofy stuff, but occasionally like properly predatory stuff that, that was quite disturbing. And I think for me, spending some of my more formative uh, early, you know, uh, drug years in that kind of environment and talking with other people who are willing to you know, call a spade a spade or identify bullshit when they saw it. And the old Terrence McKenna quote that, that I alluded to in the abstract of this, of this talk goes back to a, um, uh, oh, I'm spacing, like, but it, it, there's a talk that he gives where he talks about um, being able, the, one of the problems with new age spaces is the lack of, of willingness to gore the sacred box, right? To, to call bullshit on things that does bullshit in call. And I think there's there's quite a bit of that going on. There's there's still a reticence to do so in psychedelic spaces. I think of late, one of the contributing factors to that is a sense of careerism, right? A sense that, well, you know, the industry is just getting legitimacy. There's an opportunity to have um, a role in that, to have a dream job, you know, and I, I can't begrudge anybody a desire to get to work with psychedelics professionally. 
Um, but I will say for me, one of the reasons that I blow glass was because I wanted to avoid some of those tensions, to be able to speak freely, to be able to say, hey, I think that's bullshit and not be able to have somebody say, ah, well, then, you know, we're not going to give you any sort of um, psychedelic opportunity to, you know, derive your food, clothes and shelter from. So depending on what you want, it may not be possible for folks who are who are in graduate programs or involved in um, certain, let's say, you know, I would contend more toxic environments that perpetuate kind of hierarchies and, and control over those sorts of questions or interests. Like, I can't tell you what to do, but but I do think like examining some of the sort of superstructure and the dynamics that go into those institutions, um, it's going to be hard to to speak more freely. But at the very least, I guess, if you're in those positions, being able to have quiet conversations with your colleagues and peers who feel similarly, being able to find other people that you can talk to more broadly. Um, and I know that, that this issue is at the heart of a lot of what's going on, because I talk to a lot of researchers and therapists and scientists who find themselves in these situations where they've been offered things that seem like their dream job, and they have reservations and concerns. And I think finding coalitions of interested individuals and sort of figuring out like how we can work together to sort of change some of the landscape to make some of that behavior and some of those approaches and some of the profiteering, what have you, uh, less less socially acceptable. Um, you know, perhaps that could change things on a on a larger uh, systemic schedule or manner to some degree. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, especially with um. You know, sometimes with we've seen organisations that have a lot of money can sometimes flood the market with their ideas and try and wash out other people's ideas that don't align with them. Mm. Totally. Um, so I have uh, some questions from the audience. Um, so Andy asks, they're interested to know what kind of blowback you and Lily have experienced from your controversial podcast. Oh, man. Um, well, uh, the entire symposia team was recently banned from uh, an industry conference in Miami called Wonderland. Um, and there were rumors spread that the reason we were banned is because we were threatening to engage in like yeah, physical violence against Rick Doblin, uh, which isn't true. Um, we've had all sorts of uh, malicious rumors spread about us from things like, you know, uh, uh, seeking violence to um, having, uh, uh, it's, <laughs> I think one of the, for me personally, one of the most crushing sort of pushbacks was the silence. After, after Megan put her videos on the, the record, put excerpts from her, clinical trial sessions on the record in which um, her therapists were clearly violating numerous ethical norms. And not only are there are there therapist, psychedelic therapist forums where there were therapists defending that, but the thing that I found the most crushing was the silence, the institutional silence. Not one single research group put out a statement. And I know that there's issues with like, university legal departments and what you can and can't get through, but like the notion that, that nobody even said, you know, that's not how we would do it. These are the problems we see with that, or or simply we hold ourselves to a standard in which we don't believe this could happen for these reasons. But there was there were only two organizations that put out any sort of uh, uh, you know significant or put out really any sort of uh, noteworthy statement that I'm aware of. And one of those was later unilaterally retracted by one of the, uh, by the executive director as he was leaving the organization. And so for me, um, that sort of large scale shrug in a sense, right? The, the fact that, you know, I have heard people on various platforms reference the podcast or say that they'll talk about it, but they won't name it, right? Like this this sense that that we're somehow Voldemort for daring to, to point out the problems, that in pointing out the problem, we have somehow become the problem. Um, like, look, I don't mind being seen as a problem, but the notion, like for me going into this, 
I was aware of broader problems in psychedelia. I thought that calling attention to those problems would, um, you know, it was a matter of people not knowing. And suddenly I realized a bunch of people had known or now knew and just wished it would go away, wished that we would shut up, wished that it hadn't been, and did their best to just keep silent and act as though nothing had ever been been put out. And in some ways, like, you know, I, I can take the <laughs> getting banned from, from conferences I wasn't planning on attending, I'm, I'm still sort of gobsmacked by that sort of widespread, large-scale silence. Mm, yeah, definitely. It's not a, not a good thing. Um, that leads on to another question we've got um, about from Jamie about what institutional frameworks do you think that are, that are needed for plant people to organise and develop kind of grassroots narratives? Um, and with the question, you know, is not-for-profit non, not enough? Yeah, I appreciate the question. Um, I appreciate the question as somebody who who contributed in ways that I didn't really intend to in a sort of not-for-profit, for-profit dichotomy uh, in the early days of Compass Pathways appearing. Like like when, when I first learned about Compass Pathways, it felt so important to sort of highlight some of the problems of capitalism and sort of the predictable things, you know, pointing out in 2018, we can expect patents, we can expect attempts on monopolies, we can expect sort of data extraction and surveillance capitalism, which is its own whole dystopia. So quick, like for-profit was an easy signifier, right? Corporate, for-profit, uh, profit-seeking, rent-seeking, what have you. But I, but I appreciate the question because I think um, there's a, a deeper issue. And it, it's something we discuss on one of the Symposia uh, Plus Three podcasts. But this question more of cooperative versus non-cooperative structure, right? Like. Um, it's one thing, you know, I can certainly recall sort of grocery co-ops that are cooperatives in name, but then you think about the practice or the way the workers are all sort of mistreated. Uh, there was one where I lived for a little over a decade and it, we called it the FOOP, right? Because it called itself a co-op, but it operated as anything but. And I think there is a reality where nonprofits can be uh, incredibly uh, exploitative and abusive. And, you know, if you haven't seen the Psyched Up Four Corners documentary dealing with um, psychedelia and MMA in Australia and all of that, I, I highly recommend it. But they interview, you know, Paul Met, this, this sort of corporate um, consultant who, who sort of about institutional health and well being. And I would say, you know, go check out that interview because I, I think his words make it pretty clear that, that, not for profit isn't enough. And I, I think the question is like, I'm less concerned personally, like if there's a group of people who find that the easiest thing to do is set up a limited liability corporation because it's the le least amount of paperwork, the hurdles to getting nonprofit status are, are too much. And frankly, it doesn't matter for what they wanna do. They're going to operate as a collective. They need some sort of you know legal business structure and you know they operate with some sort of transparency and communality, uh, horizontality, like, again, I haven't, I, I, I don't know what they're doing, but to throw out this idea that, you know, uh, the, the corporate structure that is a necessity to exist as a legal entity and do certain things is something that you will be hard pressed to get around in certain cases. And so I'm, I'm far more interested in what you do than what you call yourself. Um, and I think highlighting, so, so to the question of what frameworks, um, you know, I think it depends on, on what you're doing. Like, I think right now, like thinking about some of the, the discourse in the United States around uh, endangered or protected plants and asking, like, are there ways to engage in mass propagation efforts for threatened plants that impinge upon indigenous or native practices, but and that, you know, where there can be conversations about biopiracy and extractivism, but also conversations about, you know, we're dealing with the legacy of however many years of harvesting and pushing, and can we grow things out and propagate things and, and support each other through I don't know, uh, decentralized, robust network of growers. Like I, people are already doing that. Um, but I think what, what the structure looks like depends on, on what you're trying to do with it. And yeah, and then it's, it's just a question of like, can you do what you want to do with as much horizontality and the least amount of coercion possible? Or at least that, that's how I would like to approach things. Yeah, cool. Thanks for that. We, we have a lot more questions um, from the audience, but what I might do is 
get you to get them um, from Slido and maybe address them in the panel, which is coming up next. Um, sure, happy to. Cool, so I'd just like to say thank you for your talk, it's been really good and that raised a lot of really interesting discussion, which is what it's all about. Um, Thanks for having me, I can't thank you enough. <laughs>